Well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, friends and saints of the Most High Yah. I greet every last one of you in the precious, mighty, victorious, and overcoming name of Yahshua, the Messiah. And I pray that you're all being blessed with many spiritual blessings in Yahshua, the Messiah. I am Brother Dave. I welcome you here to Straightway Life. Today's date is December 13th, 2023. It is fourth day, halfway through the week here. And today, guys, what I want to do is a teaching from the Torah portion for this week, Maquettes. Maquettes. And the title of this teaching from Genesis 41, Genesis chapter 41, is going to be uh, cycles of abundance and scarcity that you need to plan ahead for. Cycles of abundance and lack that you need to plan ahead for. Again, this week's Torah portion is maquettes at the end. And it covers Genesis chapter 41 to 44, but we're only going to be in Genesis chapter 41 today. Now, in this week's Torah portion, we continue to look at the life of Joseph and how he was exalted from a lowly prisoner to being second in command of the most powerful nation on earth at that time, Egypt. Let's recall for a moment how Joseph was sold by his brothers to the Ishmaelites and Midianites. He was then taken down to Egypt, right? And then we had the whole thing with Potiphar's wife. Joseph had become great in the house of Potiphar. In fact, he was in charge of everything. But then, then he was falsely accused of basically sleeping with Potiphar's wife. And as an act of mercy, instead of killing him, Potiphar sent him to jail. And so now, in our story, Joseph is in jail, unrighteously, and that's where we're going to pick up here in Genesis chapter 41. And again, the title of my message today from this Torah portion is cycles of abundance and scarcity that you need to plan ahead for. So let's go ahead and read Genesis chapter 41 to begin with. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 41. After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed. He dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. And behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the, in the reed grass. These plump cows fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly thin cows ate up. They ate up the seven attractive plump cows. And then Pharaoh awoke. And he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, there was a dream. So in the morning his spirit was troubled. And he sent and called for all the magicians, 
All the magicians of Egypt he sent and called for, and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Then the chief cupbearer, remember he was in prison at one time with Joseph, the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me and the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, we dreamed on the same night, he and I each having a dream with its own interpretation. A young Hebrew was there with us in the prison, a servant of the captain of the guard. When we told him about our dreams, the baker and the cupbearer, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And as he interpreted to us, so it came about. And the cupbearer here says, I was restored to my office, and the baker was hanged. He was executed. He was hanged, hung. And Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph. And they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. It's not in me. Elohim, Yahweh, will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Joseph was very humble. He's giving all credit to the Most High Yah for the answer, the interpretation of the dream that the Pharaoh is about to receive from Joseph. Yahweh gets the credit. Hallelujah. It is not in me, Joseph says. Yahweh will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream, I was standing on the banks of the Nile. Seven cows, plump and attractive, came up out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and thin, such as I had never seen in all of the land of Egypt. And the thin, ugly cows ate up the first seven plump cows. But when they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were still as ugly as at the beginning. Then I awoke, the Pharaoh says here. I also saw in my dream seven ears growing on one stalk, full and good, seven ears, withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind, sprouted after them. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears. And I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. Elohim has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Yahweh is about to do something here. The seven good cows are seven years. And the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years. 
and the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years a famine. It is, it is as I told Pharaoh, Elohim has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty, abundance, throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them, afterwards, there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land. And the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow. For it will be very severe. The famine that follows afterwards. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by Elohim. And Elohim will shortly bring it about. It's sure to happen. It's sure to happen. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. One-fifth. And let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. The food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt. The food shall be a what? A reserve, an emergency fund, if you will so that the land may not perish through the famine. Emergency storage, right? Verse 37, This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this, in whom is the spirit of Elohim? Did you know that Joseph, Yosef, had the spirit of Elohim dwelling inside of him? You see, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, did not just come on the scene in Acts chapter 2 for the very first time. Oh no. Joseph had the spirit. Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of Elohim? The Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since Elohim has showed you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. But of course, Joseph gave Yahweh the glory, the credit. The Pharaoh then goes on to say, You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring, his signet ring, Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. Royal garments, royalty. Joseph here is going from the pit to royalty, to powerful authority. So he was clothed in garments of fine linen, and a gold chain was put about his neck. And he made him ride in his second chariot, second in command. And they called out before him, bow the knee, bow the knee to Joseph, all you in the land of Egypt. 
Thus he set him, the Pharaoh set him over all the land of Egypt. What an upgrade from the pit to royalty, second in command. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphoneth Paneah, and he gave him in marriage Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On. So Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. And Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. And during those seven years, okay, during those seven plentiful years, the earth produced abundantly. And he, Joseph, gathered up all the food of those seven years, which occurred in the land of Egypt, and put the food in the cities. He put in every city the food from the fields around it. And Joseph stored up grain, emergency food storage. He stored up grain in great abundance like the sand of the sea, until he ceased to measure it, for it could not be measured. That's the kind of prosperity and abundance we're talking about during this first seven years. Before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph. Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore them to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, Elohim has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. Some of you are going through some hardship right now. But in time, you are going to be elevated, brothers and sisters. You are going to be elevated. So do not despair. Do not get discouraged. Elohim has made me forget all my hardship that he had went, to, went through prior, right? Being sold to the Ishmaelites, the Midianites, being in prison, being accused of sleeping with Potiphar's wife. Elohim has made me forget all my hardship. He will do the same with you if you're in a hard place right now, my friend. He made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. The name of the second son he called Ephraim. For Elohim has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. The seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt, well, they finally came to an end. And the seven years of famine began to come. As Joseph had said, there was famine in all lands. But in all the land of Egypt, there was bread, there was grain. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph. What he says to you, do. What he says, you do. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses. He opened up all the storehouses. And all that was in them. And sold to the Egyptians. For the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe over all the earth. Brothers and sisters, an important lesson to be learned from this week's Torah portion is this. There are going to be cycles of plenty and scarcity 
in this life. Did you hear me? There are going to be cycles of abundance and lack in this life. If you have lived for any significant length of time, you have no doubt seen these cycles and experienced them to one degree or another. You know, I can vaguely remember as a little boy the long gas lines and fuel shortages of the 1970s here in America. And I have lived long enough, brothers and sisters, to remember the various supply chain shortages that have occurred in the land over the years as well. The United States has suffered 14 official recessions since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Did you know that? There are going to be times of economic hardships in this world. It's a cyclical thing. These cycles repeat. You have those times of prosperity and plenty, and then there are those times of scarcity, times of lack. And one of the lessons that this week's Torah portion teaches us is this. I want you to look at your life and recognize that you're going to see these cycles in your own personal experience. There will be times of abundance and plenty. And there's going to be times of scarcity and lack. And that can be in any area of your life. It can be in the area of your relationships, in your finances. You can even be struggling spiritually at times. Perhaps the cycle can be seen in your health as well. Right? There are going to be times in your life when you have abundance, prosperity, right? And then there are going to be times when you experience scarcity or lack for a period of time. Maybe even to try and refine you, to test you. In our Torah portion, brothers and sisters, what did Joseph tell Pharaoh to do? He basically said, Use this information to plan ahead. Use your dream and, the, and, and its interpretation to plan ahead. In other words, develop a little bit of foresight. Right? Now, the Pharaoh and Joseph, they were coming at this thing from the perspective of a dream where it was revealed that famine and trouble was eventually coming. Well, we already know these things are coming, brothers and sisters. Have you all heard of the tribulation? Right? It's coming. I don't know precisely when in terms of a date, but it's coming. Because this book right here says it's coming. And in between now and then, we know there's going to be relatively good times. And then there's going to be the difficult times. All of this stuff sort of cycles around time and time again. Okay? And so, brothers and sisters, if we have foresight, and if we use wisdom, we can plan for these things. It's important, to, it's important to have an emergency fund. Why? Because, because stuff goes wrong. Stuff happens. Okay? People lose jobs. Expensive things are going to break and need replacing. People get sick. I mean, things happen that cost people a lot of money. Right? Right? 
and with foresight, you know these things are coming, and you can plan for it, all right? Over time, brothers and sisters, over many years, put money aside for things that you need, things that you know that over time are going to eventually grow old and break down. Setting money aside so that you can buy that new thing when the time comes, instead of spontaneously trying to find a way to buy the new one, all of a sudden and on the fly when you need it. You see, most people have no foresight whatsoever. They operate on the fly. They operate spontaneously without any advanced preparation, without any planning or thinking. And if this new thing that they need, if it ends up costing thousands and thousands of dollars, they're in a bind. I mean, perhaps it's a new piece of equipment that they need, or a new car, or whatever. You've got to plan for these things, brothers and sisters. If you have been putting aside some money over a period of 10 years, you can probably afford a new car when your old one breaks down. Hallelujah. Our Torah portion for this week teaches us to have foresight, brothers and sisters. And we should have foresight when it comes to natural disasters, too. Things like um, tornadoes, hurricanes, flooding, fires, earthquakes, and famine. We need to be prepared for these contingencies, these possibilities, because they're bound to happen at some point. If you have a house and you plan to stay in it for a while, you're going to need a new roof at some point. Right? I mean, they don't last forever. Not only that, <laughs> there might be other things that go wrong as well. Things like plumbing and electrical. Do you have a car? Okay, that car, as you know, is nothing but a money pit. Okay, eventually, you'll need to replace the transmission, or the radiator, or the alternator, or some other major component, right? Major repairs are going to be needed at some point, and those major repairs are costly. That's no secret. Prepare. You know... Most people here in America, if they had an emergency of some sort, they could not come up with $1,000 to handle and deal with that emergency. We're, we're talking well over half of the population of America. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I find that anything large, like home appliances, they're going to cost over $1,000 to replace, okay? If your refrigerator goes or your washer, your dryer, if your water heater goes or your air conditioning unit, if any of those things go, you know, things which cannot be prepared or repaired, you're probably are going to spend $1,000 or more to replace those things. And so with foresight, brothers and sisters, with foresight, you should be figuring out how to have the resources on hand ahead of time that you need, should you need them. Okay? The same thing with food storage. Okay, what if the truckers... Stop delivering food to the grocery stores for a time. 
Are you prepared to go a month or more without being able to buy food at the supermarket? I mean, believe me, that could very easily happen. Very easily. And so, our Torah portion is telling us to put something aside during times of abundance in our lives. We all have times in our lives where things are going at least fairly well, relatively well. And if not, well, then you need to be doing something different. Okay, if you are never getting ahead in life, maybe you need to learn some new skills, valuable skills, right? Maybe you need to apply yourself more. Maybe you need to budget better and have better, mo uh, better money management during times of abundance. Stop wasting money on frivolous things, brothers and sisters. Stop eating out all the time. I mean, that will eat up your money real quick. You know that, right? And the same thing goes for entertainment. Okay? Listen. If you are 50 years old, and you are still where you were at when you were a young man at 20, something is seriously wrong. Something seriously needs to change. Let me give you a little insight here. here. Here is some hard truth for some of you. You are exactly where you, where you are right now, belong. Where you want to go, you cannot go unless you change to become that person. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right now, you're exactly where you belong. Not because you necessarily deserve it. I didn't say that. I say belong because the person that you are now cannot get any further unless he becomes more. Okay, you need to add, you need to change, you need to improve and level up. If you want something different, you've got to become something different. Oh, hallelujah! Maybe you need to be someone with more discipline and self-control. Having more foresight. You need more of something. You have to do something different. You have to do perhaps less of something that is holding you back as well. Maybe you need to do less of something else that is holding you back. You following me? The point of today's Torah teaching is this, brothers and sisters. You've got to know that hard times are coming at some point through no fault of your own. Okay, it, it, it's part of the cycle of life, this side of the kingdom, okay? If you are a seasonal employee or have a seasonal job and you know that you have abundant work at certain times of the year while at other times there's going to be less work and you can even ex expect to get laid off, for a few weeks or months, you need to learn to budget and plan for the fact that you're only making money during the times when your job is in season. Okay? Most people don't have that kind of foresight. They're not putting money aside. They're just rolling with the flow and living on the fly, spontaneous, Oh, and by the way, just as an aside, if you are not tithing, don't expect to be blessed. You won't be. If you are not giving the tenth of your increase to the Most High Yah, you're going to be cursed. 
You're not going to get ahead when you are stealing from Yahweh, when you are robbing him. Read the prophet Malachi. I'm just saying, guys, some of you are wondering why you can never get ahead. Are you robbing from Yahweh? That must be a part of this discussion as well. By the way, tithing began even before there was a Levitical priesthood. Abraham tithed. Jacob promised to give a tithe of all that he possessed. Tithing was part of the Melchizedek priest system even before the Levitical priest system was implemented. Abraham promised to tithe on the spoils of war. All the increase that he would get from the spoils of war. Now, in our Torah portion here today, Pharaoh is being told through a dream that for seven years there is going to be abundance. And if he doesn't put something aside during that abundant time in preparation for the famine of seven years afterwards that's coming, it's not going to be good. In these cycles, brothers and sisters, of plenty and scarcity, foresight and planning are necessary, even for survival in some cases. In other cases, without foresight and planning, you're just going to struggle terribly. I mean, you may survive, all right, but you're going to have a lot of grief, and it's going to be a, a terrible struggle brothers and sisters. To survive and to prosper, you have to have a plan. You have to plan and prepare. By the way, that applies both in the natural and in the spiritual. You know, there's an old saying there's an old saying that says, um, those who fail to plan, plan to fail. <laughs> that saying is so true. There are going to be things in your life, unpleasant things, that are likely to pop up at some point through no fault of your own. You don't know. You don't know when necessarily. Okay. Actually... <laughs> Some of you do know when, and you're still not doing anything about it. And that's really sad. That's really sad. Some of you have large bills that come, that come around maybe once a year or twice a year. And somehow those bills slip your mind and you're like, oh my, surprise. Oh, what, what do I do now? Some of you know, some of you know that you're going to have a huge tax liability coming up next year. And yet you refuse to act on that reality ahead of time. Why? I'm just saying, guys, I mean... You need to get on top of these things ahead of time and stop acting all surprised when the appointed time comes around. Okay? Some of you, with all due respect, you're, you're like a young child who knows that he has a final exam coming up in school tomorrow and you're not ready for it. Okay? Okay? Didn't the teachers tell you in advance that it was coming? Well, yeah. <laughs> You've known about this for a month now. Right? Yeah. Well, why didn't you plan for it? Where is the discipline? Where is the foresight? Was your plan to wait until the last minute and then panic? I mean... That's what some of you grown adults are doing in many facets of your life. That's not good, guys. Not good at all. Don't be a last-minute kind of person. 
That's not a good plan. That's a failure to plan, really. And so, this to me is the most important teaching that I can glean from this Torah portion, at least as far as Genesis chapter 41 is concerned. You should be having at least some kind of relative abundance in your life at various times where things seem to be going relatively well, okay? Take some of that and put it away for the scarcity that's coming. Put it away in reserve for the scarcity that's coming. Now, the worst thing that's coming, and it is coming, probably in our lifetime, that thing being the Great Tribulation. Are you preparing ahead of time for it? There's nothing that you're going to do to stop it. It's coming. It was prophesied. Be ready for it. Get your spiritual house in order. order. Be prepared for it. Mentally, spiritually, even physically, but most importantly, spiritually. Do the things that you need to do now so that when it comes, you're ready. Oh, hallelujah. And this teaching comes from the Torah portion for this week. Torah portion maquettes. Again, the title of this teaching was Cycles of Abundance and Scarcity That You Need to Plan For. Oh, hallelujah. And with that being said, friends and saints, as always, stay encouraged. Stay encouraged. The King is coming. King Yeshua is coming. And until next time, friends and saints, be blessed. Oh, hallelujah.